Let me see if we can give a uh, start with my outline uh, a little bit. Uh, sure. Can everybody see that all right? You've been at this for 31 years? Yeah, 31 years. Yeah, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> um, well, let's just start with um, the purpose of, of the meeting tonight and, and what we'd like to call conversations. Uh, I think it's really important during election time and any time really during the year to I have conversations about <clears throat> subjects that are affecting the town. I, I don't see a lot of that happening with the town board in terms of uh, town hall type meetings. Uh, they stick pretty much to the regular scheduled meetings uh, that they have uh, twice a month for town board and, and of course once a month for the planning board. Yeah. But I think it's important <clears throat> that we have a conversation and talk about the issues facing the town and, and give a chance for not only the public but the candidates that are running for office on November 4th. November 2nd to have a chance to listen and uh, comment if they want on any of the subjects uh, we're discussing. So we have three um, consecutive Wednesdays uh, being, tonight is being the first, October 13th, on the Hudson River waterfront will be the subject for tonight. And on October 20th, we'll be speaking about the Patriot Hills and Letchworth property sale. Um, and we're gonna produce um, what we'd like to think is a fact sheet about that subject uh, to give people some information. And of course, we're welcome to receive any additional information that any of you might have or want to send to us. Um, that email address is stonypointer <clears throat> at optonline.net. Um, we'd like to put together a set of facts because it is so important that we make decisions based on facts and not misinformation. So that's something space has always uh, been important to us is, is to be sure we do our research and talking about Susan, she's excellent at doing research and we, we do find the details and we put up that information and let people make their own decisions and also express our own opinions about certain subjects. We are nonpartisan, so we do not, do not endorse candidates, but we do take positions on issues and advocate for better land use policies in the town. Uh, and October 27th, we're gonna do one on the Main Street and, and Route 9W, 9W Business District. Uh, which we think is also important. So we'll have some time to prepare some materials prior to those meetings. Uh, but this is an important part of our democracy, I think, is being informed and participating and understanding the issues. And we're happy that you can join us uh, this evening. To start with um, the Stony Point George, waterfront. Can I, just, yes. can I just point something out? Sure. I just noticed that the flyer that you sent out, which is what I forwarded to quite a few people in our community, um, doesn't have the link on it. Yeah, I sent have it your out. Message. Your message has the link, That's, but I didn't realize the flyer didn't, so. Right, yeah, you know, those those um, Zoom links are hard to type in, really. You got a link to them, so I put them on Facebook. I sent it out with the email. If you forwarded the yeah. email with the- That's how I got it. With the Just flyer, the yeah, it would that have may a be link. a reason some people yeah, that's also a good point. I'll see if I can come up with a better plan for that next time, Alan. Thank you for raising that. Um, yeah, because what happens is you can't type in all those letters they give you for um, for Zoom sometimes. So it's better to have a real link and uh, to put that on a flyer. I don't think people would type it in. So I'll figure out something better uh, for the next couple of uh, meetings. Um, so here's some aerial photography. This, these photographs were taken uh, basically a month before Superstorm Sandy hit. Uh, our coast, and you can see uh, what the Stony Point waterfront looked like at that time. What was that? Uh, what, what year was that that it hit? 2012, I believe. And this is a photograph, aerial photographs. We had an aerial photographer shooting uh, for some other purposes and get some pictures of them. See that again? Okay. Just if you have your audio turned on, maybe turn it off just so that it doesn't create any background sound. And we'll give you a chance to ask questions. We're going to do a little presentation. And I have a, um, a guest to, this evening to speak is uh, Jeff Anzavino, who will, is from Cena Cutson. He is the Land Use Advocacy Director at Cena Cutson. And I've asked Jeff to speak about the work that Cena Cutson does. And they're involved a lot in land use along uh, what river community waterfronts and, and has a lot of good information for us as well. Um, so here's a view of what Stony Point, from the battlefield view, looking south of Stony Point. Because we think of Stony Point as the battle 
of Stony Point, uh, July 1779. It's a not only a local important date, but a national important date. And, and the fact that we have a landmark, historic landmark right here in our town uh, is something that I don't think is emphasized an awful lot. But here's a view just south of that battlefield where uh, there is a, a planned development, as I'm sure you know about, uh, for Eagle Bay. This is what the marina looked like. It was a real working marina prior to Superstorm Sandy. Of course, it doesn't look like that today. Uh, it's only taken one month before the storm hit. Uh, here's, an, here's a basic vicinity map of what uh, Eagle Bay looks like in relationship to the Stony Point battlefield. Um, condo mixed use development that uh, we've been following now for eight years. It started under uh, Wayne Courts. Uh, the town gave some zoning to allow for something beyond uh, limited um, protected waterfront use, which originally we in the town didn't really want to build much more than just boat related type businesses, but then that was changed uh, in 2015 uh, under supervisor Jeff Finn and Jim Monaghan was on the board at the time. They approved uses for the properties for commercial and residential use as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those in a couple of minutes. So we have about 41 acres of property <clears throat> in total with about 20, a little more than 20 acres of that underwater and about four acres, I believe, in wetlands um, right south of the Stony Point battlefield. Um, they're requesting their, in their plans, it's not 268, it's actually 264 residential units, uh, which could be about 700 people. Uh, they're claiming they have a right to build up to 290 uh, units there. Um, these are some of the more recent uh, sketches that they've done. Of course, they look very nice. Uh, <laughs> if you like these kind of buildings, they're um, located um, right along the waterfront. There's going to be four. Uh, towers, basically four, four story towers. Um, this is a view of it, they don't. And there's been some controversy about this, uh, as I'm sure some of you have heard um, on a number of different issues. Um, this has been in process for quite a while since, like I say, since 2018. And then um, more recently, the, um, the, the draft environmental impact statement was done in 2020 last year, February. When a lot of people George, turned out to that excuse meeting, me, you go back to that picture you, on the on the what the rendering is. Sure, it's, we that, we passed too fast. It, it's an it's an atrocity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is you're right. I mean, you know, there are artist sketches of what of what they want to put in there. The um, the part of the plan um, before I go on to the other slides, part of it is to create a a public promenade or or walkway along the Hudson, which is one of the things the town wanted in 2018 well, when they did the zone, the rezoning. It was a 2018 or 2015, it was around that time, but the maybe it was 2015 when the zoning was made and the proposal came in after that. I think it switched over from wing courts over to the current developer for Eagle Bay. Started out as the breakers and then went to the current developer for Eagle Bay around oh, 2018, okay. I believe. So that's probably more accurate in terms of the time frame. But um, these are the sketches that they're showing the planning board. And, um, and, and you, you do know, just, I'm not going to intervene to note that um, Pace University and, and uh, Riverkeeper and um, Clearwater fought a lawsuit that now demands access to any building. So the promenade is not just, you know, gee, we're yeah. going to give you a promenade. Uh, access to the Hudson River and any new buildings are, are mandatory. So, uh, you know, we have to fight for what is our right anyway. Right. Um, in addition to the promenade, um, there's a fishing pier, which you don't see in this picture. Um, I'm not sure if I had it in the previous picture or not. Um, but it's a, a fishing pier that they're planning to build, but the um, Army Corps of Engineers and I think the DEC was disputing whether they could build it as wide as they wanted, which was eight feet wide and the length that they wanted to build it. So there's some discussion now. I'm not sure it's been resolved as to whether they're going to let them build it that wide or something smaller than that. But that was another type of access that they are planning for the river as well. Um, but the controversies that have come up, you know, people came to the meetings in person when we could do in-person meetings um, about this development. People were paying attention to it. Um, 
The issues, of course, traffic, the number of units that are being put in here could generate as many as 700 people. And you could figure out how many cars might come from that. Um, the flooding on Beach Road, which the County of Rockland has um, decided it's not going to make any significant improvements to Beach Road. And we know how often that floods out in terms of access to the site and to the waterfront. The sewer capacity, uh, the town um, does not have the sewer capacity to handle this development. And my concern is that they've been giving Eagle Bay increased numbers of units um, beyond what was originally passed in the zoning. The zoning called for 10 units per acre. And there's about 17 acres of dry land on this property. Okay, the rest of it is underwater or in wetlands. Um, but in addition to that, they, and I'll, and I'll talk about this local law that they added onto that, which gives credit for underwater acreage of which there's 20 acres underwater. And that brings the numbers up quite a bit. And then the, the town board uh, made what they called a text change uh, only a couple of years ago and accommodated the request by the developer to not have to put in as many boat slips as was required by the original zoning. The original zoning required one boat slip for every condo unit. And they changed that to allow for uh, one um, boat slip for every three condo units. So, so by doing that, they've allowed them to increase the condo units by three times um, by only putting in one third the number of boat slips because there was a limit as to how many boat slips they could actually put in. So this also increased the number and it was done as what they called a text change. It was not really a text change. It was significant impact on the total number of units that you see. And I, my feeling is a lot of it has to do with sewer capacity and the town wanting to increase revenue in order to pay for sewer upgrades that are needed, not only for this, but for the town in general. Um, Beach Road, as we know, floods out all the time. And this would be the major access to the property for emergency vehicles uh, to, you're looking at the south side of Beach Road near Main Street. Uh, and of course, the, the result of after Superstorm Sandy, a lot of the properties got destroyed there. But the one on the right shows a more recent photo of the type of flooding that people who live down there know is all too common and um, would be the major access to the property with no plans for improvement by the County of Rockland uh, Highway Department. Um, these are some of the bullet points that came from the draft environmental impact statement about the real cost of this development, um, talking about somewhere in site increase of people around 504 to 637 uh, increase in number of people. And the re report says that uh, 3.2 to 4% increase in population. Um, there's um, additional cost to the, NOC this came from the, the DEIS, the North Rockland School District would be between a million two two six eight eighty and and 3,298,944, depending on the number of units and whether they were sold or rented. They, uh, they base those costs on differently if they are sold versus whether they are rented. And um, so the cost per student, we know what that is. And so we could talk about a potential increase in the cost, but there will be a revenue coming from this property. But they're also talking the police chief had anticipated there was a need for at least one to two additional police officers and a new police car. So there's other costs that are in addition to the ones that the, the benefits that the company is saying or the developer is saying they're going to pay to the town. Um, the upgrades to Beach Row, we're not sure who's going to pay for those once the condos are in or the taxpayers are then going to be required to do it. There's no offsite improvements as far as the developer putting in uh, road roads there. Um, and they're saying they're going to be paying the town $6 million annually. Um, but of course, there's expenses involved too. And I'm not sure how accurate that number is. Um, Where did they come with the $6 million, George? How did they find that money? I don't know. Uh, that was, uh, you know, I, I believe that was in the DEIS. I, I, I produced these bullet points when we went through the DEIS last year in February, 2020. And this is one of the points they said there. Now, whether that's accurate or not, you know, Space had asked um, in the DEIS that the developer produce a, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? A, uh, a cost benefit analysis. Uh, which is important, as you know, many times these things go through and people think they're being promised all these things. But in the end, you know, we don't actually get what we're promised and the costs sometimes are hidden or not discussed at these uh, land use reviews and you end up coming out with more costs like the sewer, for example, or other kinds of costs that we may have to incur and as taxpayers down the road once the most number of people live in our town, um, there are costs that go along with local tax 
uh, costs as well. Um, one of the other issues besides the numbers of cars is the access to the property on Beach Road is emergency access, which the developer has said would be through um, a CSX underpass at Hunter Place. Um, some of you don't know, just north of Tompkins Avenue, there's an underpass that goes into the development back there. And um, that, that uh, underpass um, needs to dig down to allow a 13.5 foot clearance for fire vehicles to get in their emergency vehicles. And um, CSX uh, has not agreed at this point whether or not it would even allow the developer to um, dig down. We're talking digging down about three feet in order to allow the clearance necessary for emergency vehicles to get through. And also they have to put in sewer and water and telecommunications, I think would go under that line as well, under that uh, bridge as well. And of course, if you know that bridge at all, it's, uh, so I got a picture of it here. It's a very um, old bridge, uh, some, some is like a hundred year old bridge or something, but it's, you know, it's a major important bridge for CSX and whether they would allow, the, you're talking about the width here, very narrow and uh, whether it lets a fire truck through, I'm kind of, hard for me to visualize that um, from this photo, but they would be digging down three feet in order to allow what they called emergency access to the site. Uh, George, very quickly, mm -hmm. back to the picture, please. Yeah, sure. The way they are skirting around that so that you know this, Mr. Ziegler is a very good engineer architect. They are claiming that the sewer line needs to be repaired or substantially supported. And in that case, CSX cannot refuse them the right to dig under that underpass. It will be a very dangerous undertaking, but the way they are going to walk around getting under that and making it deeper is the fact that the sewer line needs to be repaired. Uh, Mr. Ziegler let the cat out of the bag on that one in one of the last meetings. Right. I, I don't have a, yeah, you're right. I, and I don't have a photograph of the other underpass, you know, the one at Tompkins Avenue, is everyone's more familiar with that one, <clears throat> because we use it. This is not really a, an underpass that people are using. I understand that the marinas use it or something at some point to take boats out or something from the uh, marinas at one point, but it's not a public pass through at this point. But mm -hmm. Tompkins Avenue, originally, they were just going to put stop signs there, figuring that stop signs would be adequate to deal with the traffic issues. Um, but the planning board is asking them to do a traffic study. They did a traffic study. I don't have a lot of faith in traffic studies. <laughs> I've seen a lot of them and it's hard to tell whether they're gonna work or not until after the thing is built. And then people forgot about the whole thing and it's like five years later. But they wanna put two traffic lights at Tompkins Avenue, one at Beach Road in Tompkins and one, is that Depot Place they call that there? The next road up, there's a small road there. So they wanna actually have two lights uh, at the Tompkins Avenue underpass. Uh, one right there at Beach Road and one one block in, I think it's called Depot Place, um, small road on the left as you go under the under the underpass on Tompkins Avenue. And they would be coordinated. I have a video of the traffic engineer explaining this, the person that was hired as the, as the traffic engineer. And it's confusing to listen to. He claims it's gonna work in synchronous when people come pass under that underpass at Tompkins Avenue, but the emergency vehicles can't get under there. So this would be emergency access. Uh, is what they're saying. And that's what they would need, an alternative means of emergency access. So here's another view of the um, of the peninsula here. We're talking this development being to the right of this picture. Um, one of the things that I've always wanted to see the town do, and uh, don't George, really I have a lot of evidence of it, I'd like to hear what others think, is we don't really use this what is a nationally recognized historic battlefield as any kind of a draw in the town. And when you think about economic development and means of bringing people into the town, uh, the Stony Point battlefield could be that. Uh, now we're building a, a condo unit in the shadow of the Stony Point battlefield. And we don't really use the Stony Point battlefield as a town in my view, you know, to, and I've lived here quite a while. I don't see it really being promoted as a place. Of course, we don't have the hotels and other things we're looking for here as well for people to stay. but. The idea of thinking of, of tourism as an economic development source seems to me to be something the town could be doing more about. In this case, we're, we're putting condo units near it, but we're not really uh, engaging in any kind of conversation about the battlefield being a source of, of revenue or tourism. And the other things, we got 
West Point right up the river and you got Woodbury Commons. You know, we got to think more regionally about how we're going to build economic development. That will be part of our conversation in the third meeting, but I just wanted to throw that out as well. George, um, can I ask a question? Sure, of course. I, I was trying to, I forgot, I had mood on mute. Um, <laughs> regarding, the over, regarding the overpass, is there a problem when you dig down uh, three or four feet that you're actually going to be creating you know, a little lake in a storm where, in other words, where there's an emergency based upon flooding a hurricane or whatnot, you actually might be creating a trap for the fire trucks? If yes. Yeah, that has been brought up, Michael. Um, in fact, it was brought up at the hearing that the actual level that you're going to be lowering this will be lower than the level of it actually going out into the river for drainage purposes and that it could cause that problem. That is an open issue that had been brought up to the planning board during the draft environmental impact statement that they're not really gonna match in terms of the levels and that we could indeed be creating a, a source of water, you know, three feet down. And this water table is very low here probably, I'm sure. Well, if you have to flee, if you have to flee based upon a hurricane yeah. and rising waters from the Hudson yes. and that causes this to become a trap, Yes. Then it's not an emergency exit anymore. Instead, it's a trap. Yeah. And, you know, God forbid you have a fire or something out there and a, and a storm, you know, and you can't get through on Beach Road with the fire trucks. They only come in this way. And then how do people get out? You know, it seems to me there's a real problem in terms of coordinating any kind of emergency access. I, I wrote to ask if the fire chief of Stony Point, uh, Wayne Hose, had any comments, written comments about this proposal for emergency exit and um, there was none. I, I was told that the police chief had not commented on this and I thought that would be something I would expect the police chief, I mean I'm sorry, the fire chief to have had a, an opinion about as to whether this was an adequate um, plan. Uh, and like you can't I said, really see, you but, can't really see it from this picture, but there's already a dip there of probably 18 inches to two feet. So where that red and white bar is across the um, path there, there is a distinct dip already. So you're, you're adding to an existing 18 inches to two right. feet, to another three feet. I mean, it's literally going to be a trench under that bridge. So you're going to have to significantly level down and up on each side of it. Yeah, that's right. How do you create that slope that's going to allow you to get underneath it? Yeah. George, can I add something real quick? Sure, Susan, go ahead. Area as you look at it, you looked at the aerial sites from the peninsula going back towards town, was at one point part of the brickyards. Mm -hmm. The majority of the area to the river side of the rail track is fill. And it was done so that they could build the rail line. So no matter how deep you go, you have a water issue. It isn't that it's in the water, it's 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 beyond in the water table. It is the water table. Mm -hmm. CSX has traditionally not allowed anyone to touch their infrastructure. I believe the rule is, and I'm not a federal person, is that if they begin to make any kind of structural change, they have to start to bring their infrastructure up to current town code. They can't afford to do that. So I, as much as time as we can spend on this overpass, I don't believe it will ever be touched. So, but just for historic purposes, this is built in the river. Mm -hmm. All of the land in front of this, where you can see those boats was literally river. It was now fill. They can't handle the water problem on that side because it's in the water table. Yeah. You know, George, um, we're, we're in a, a little bit in the, in the weeds, uh, in, in the sense, uh, with your with program here, it, it seems to me we, we have to think about all of this stuff in a uh, 21st century post-COVID and also climate change reality world. We have rising sea levels. We're going to have bigger storms, which is going mm -hmm. to create problems on the waterfront number one. Another thing regarding COVID is people are learning now that they can work from home and not have to commute into the city all the time. So there's an opportunity for suburban places like us, especially with fantastic resources to, to attract people here instead of having our young people you know, leave to go elsewhere. I mean, we have 
we have Harriman Park, the largest park in Southern New York to our west, right near you and me, George. Mm -hmm. We have, in my opinion, the most scenic part of the Hudson River to our east. We have Bear Mountain and West Point to our north. So what I think we should be doing is we should be up, updating the master plan and start getting some people thinking about how to re-envision Stony Point so that we get out of 1950s thinking and start thinking in terms of what we have, the tremendous um, natural advantages here we have with, uh, when I went up to Cove Deli um, over the summer, there were a whole bunch of people, bicyclists there, who came up from the city, over from Garrison on bicycles into the town. We should have people coming up as a tourist destination for recreation for bicyclists that, that they can use the park. We, we should have a technology center and, um, and, and the arts stuff in the central, center part of the town between uh, the, the Hudson and Harriman, for example, uh, Patriot Hills, which is going to be the topic for uh, the next next week. But we should be looking at what we have as far as our assets and then start thinking, you know, long term with a vision toward how to make our town more economically vibrant and, and affordable for people and, and have things here so that our young people don't decide to leave. Instead, they stay around. I mean, right. those are right. things Let's, I think we should be thinking about. Well, I appreciate those comments. Uh, we've been pushing for the need for a master plan. Space has been talking about that for a while. We feel that uh, the town has been doing a lot of patchwork zoning uh, adjustments uh, in a lot of areas of the town and that we do need to, to do a master plan, which would mean putting a hold on building and, and re-envisioning our master plan and re-envisioning our town. But let me get through a couple of these slides and I want to get to Jeff before we um, get too far into the discussion of ideas. Um, so here was a photograph that uh, Jeff had actually taken um, of the waterfront view from the peninsula of Stony Point. And they did, Cena Cutson did like a Photoshop or what they considered to be a possible uh, representation of what those condos might look like. Um, there is a process that the federal government had called the Section 108 process <clears throat> to uh, review the impact on historical resources uh, and federal national uh, historical resources and space and Cena Cutson were both um, allowed to participate in this process, which is still under review by the um, Army Corps of Engineers. And uh, this was information in addition to other written letters and stuff that have been provided uh, to talk about the size of this impact, not only on the traffic and other issues we've discussed, but also the visual impact on what is a, a national historic resource. Um, this, this law that I mentioned in terms of the towns adopting, this is important not only for Eagle Bay, but also for all the development along the waterfront. And that's this 2215-16A um, portion which says that the builders have the right to um, receive credits for 50% of what is underwater uh, within a freshwater wetlands, stream banks. And it's been mostly applied to, you know, like large properties up in Tompkins Cove where somebody has a, a pond or a stream running through their property and they wanna build on the land. So what they do is they give them a 50% credit of what they own under the water towards buildable on land uh, specifically for that property. But of course, uh, what happened was when the town board uh, in 2015 uh, made this uh, change to the zoning, they actually said it applies to 215.16a, uh, and that gives credit for also what's underwater. So not only did the developer get the 10 units per acre on land, but they get 50% of what's underwater. In the case of Eagle Bay, uh, there's 20 acres underwater on the Hudson River, so they're getting 100 units basically from what they own underwater towards buildable on land. And this is another thing that's adding significantly to the density, not only for this development, but the next marina down basically could do the same thing if they wanted to with the current zoning. So it's something to keep in mind that this affects cumulatively all along our waterfront and has a much bigger impact than it ever would on individual lots of land inland where the law had been applied. This had never been applied before to the Hudson River. And we are objecting strongly to the application of this towards uh, Eagle Bay. Um, 17 are you acres. Are you saying the Hudson River is not a stream? Yeah, right, it's not a stream. And this was a local law. It never mentions river, never mentions um, salt water. Um, I did receive a letter from um, Riverkeeper, uh, John Lipscomb about this area is definitely 
uh, saline and saltwater wetlands, not fresh water. So there's an issue here as to whether the town can apply this law. And the town planning board is meeting tomorrow night in a, in a, in a tomorrow afternoon in a workshop meeting or a TAC meeting with the idea on the 28th, the Thursday, the fourth Thursday, they will be voting on a preliminary approval for this property. And the law states that it is the planning board, not the previous building inspector who had been the one who included this law in the plans from the start, but indeed the planning board is supposed to make a determination as to whether this law should apply to this development at the site plan approval process, which is where they are right now. So there's an issue with that and the Rockland County Department of Planning raised this issue um, about being an overreach in terms of development in its letter to the planning board uh, in August of 2018. But George, how do George they... are you going to that meeting, George? Are you going to that planning board meeting where they're supposed to vote? Well, they're gonna vote on the 28th. Yeah, I hope to attend that meeting. They're still having their meetings live, um, but they're gonna have that meeting um, on the 28th. I believe it's the 28th, the fourth Thursday uh, is the Can next please meeting. Please send a reminder. Yeah, we will. Reminder, yeah. I'll try to uh, just north of this site, just real quick, I'm just going to hit a couple of these because I do want to uh, move along. Uh, just north of this site, of course, is the Tilton Quarry. Uh, and there was a plan to put in a, 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 a resource recovery business there to fill in the quarry. The quarry is a big hole in the ground. And this was, uh, we thought it had potential to listen to the developer on this. And, and he met with us and I thought it had some good ideas, but there was concern about what else might be dumped in there and things like this. So it was sort of sort of turned down without actually being proposed, but there was some discussion about using that, what is a large quarry area that's unusable now and becomes a liability for the company in some way and turning it into a park eventually after 16 years or so of using it because there's a lot of construction debris uh, in the area that has to get sent someplace else. And they thought this could be a, a possible way to, to reuse this property. So whether you know, you're in favor of it or not, this was a discussion along the waterfront um, and then here's a here's a view south uh, part of the town as well. The um, you've got that the uh, parcel, that last parcel has been sold to a business entity from Chippy, right. and that they will be doing yeah. utility work. They'll be doing what, Susan? They will be doing all there. They, there's major plans. I can send it out to people, right. but they are talking putting in more docks, building. Uh, I wasn't prepared to go into that. Right. Ship has actually bought property all through there. That has been bought by a major utility builder, a right. company that comes in and does the uh, the build of pi major pipelines and uh, wire. So that's going to be a very industrial site. I understand. What land are we talking about? This is north of, this is the Tilcon property. Okay. Wow. North of, the, north of the battlefield, you know, the Tilton it's not property. very sneaky, so what the hell. So we got the USG oh. property down here. We got the southern part of the, of the riverfront property. Um, and Baymar, which was just approved uh, last year, was the uh, uh, mobile home, uh, which was destroyed by Sandy. Uh, 130 some odd units, some as close as only 10 feet apart, uh, with five feet of side yard on each side. Um, were squeezed in our view, squeezed into this site. And uh, I'm sure they're gonna be nice condos, but they're gonna be very close together. And you can see the development plan for that. So that's another issue with the, with the issue of uh, sewage and traffic on the other end of the riverfront property, on the other end of Stony Points Riverfront. Waterfront. And um, I don't know how many of you know about the plans that there's the um, policeman, the PBA uh, hmm. has been working with individuals in the town who wanna to build a skateboard park right on the Clark Park property, that, that open uh, acreage there. There's not a public, lot of public discussion about it. Uh, these are some of the plans I had to foil to get, uh, this is the drawings of what they want to put there, concrete, which of course is not going to absorb any water. It's all going to send more water down into Beach Road. And you know, I personally, I question whether it's a smart idea for us to use Prime River front property for something like this, or whether this really should belong up in Letchworth or someplace where kids can access it because here you have it right down on the waterfront, but this is a plan. And, and when something like this is done on behalf of the town, I'm not sure even what kind of a planning process it goes through. It may just get built out of sight. We don't really see the planning process because it is a town project. So um, that's what is being planned so far. So with that, I'd like to- skate um, park. I, I thought that whole skate park thing flopped years ago with, wasn't Ailers trying to get that through? 
Yeah, I don't. Yeah, exactly. He's not living in town anymore. He was one of the people behind getting it started. But uh, there seems to be um, still money was raised. You know, not not my problem that the money was raised. The thing is now they they feel like they, they want to build something there. And this is prime real estate on the waterfront. And, you know, this, in my view, is kind of a limited use in terms of who would use this. Uh, and of course, does it make sense to put something like this down on the waterfront when we could be using an area, maybe perhaps up by the town park or someplace where uh, you know, parents can bring their kids, they can play baseball or they can play basketball and they can go skateboarding and not have it as a separate place that far down by the riverfront. I don't know how well thought out that is, uh, whether there's interest among the people and the kids that wanted to build it originally are probably older now anyway. So I don't even know what the current interest is in this. Uh, there should be some kind of an understanding about whether this is a good use of our town land. Um, I think there's an problems. interest. I think there's an interest because I mean, my son was actually working with Mike Ellers back when he was a kid. Now he's 23 yeah. with this thing. And they actually had another fundraiser for this thing in 2019. Yeah, I know. Um, and now, and I thought it was going to go under lowland, but then there was issues with the stream and the brook there. So they didn't do it there. And now I don't, I still don't think it has a home, but I heard that the, the Clark park was not going to, that they were not going to put it there. Oh, not that was the last I was they also, spent money on a. They spent money on a architect or somebody to render it for that property. But you might be right. So I don't know the current status of that. I don't claim to know the current status of that plan. But that is something that's being talked about for our waterfront. So I wanted to at least mention it. Um, let me see if I can um, stop the share here. Um, I wanted to introduce um, Jeff uh, Jeff Anzavino, who's the director of land use advocacy for Scenic Hudson. I'm sure you know. And he could tell you more about Cena Cutson, but Cena Cutson is world known. Uh, they happen to be right here in Poughkeepsie um, as helping communities better understand and make better use of their waterfronts. And, and of course, he's seen a lot in his work of what other communities are doing. So I, Jeff was nice enough to, to uh, agree to be on this call and, and give us a bit of his insight into the subject of, of waterfront usage. And I'd like to uh, hand it over to Jeff if you're there. Jeff, there you are. Okay. Jeff Anzavino. You're, Thanks, yeah. George. Uh, you're uh, been doing a great job there for decades uh, at the helm of space. And uh, if it wasn't for people like George and, uh, and the members of space uh, working for the same things that we are in the communities, we wouldn't be able to get as much done as we, we do. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, um, I mean, we just spend a lot of time hearing about um, uh, what we've missed opportunities at uh, Eagle Bay um, and some of the other threats uh, to the Stony Point waterfront. I'd like to kind of um, look to the future and provide you with some uh, information about revitalizing Hudson Riverfronts, which is Scenic Hudson's smart growth guidance for water development. And I hope that as now the town turns the page when uh, future development is proposed along the riverfront, you'll um, use some of the guidance that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, now, George, can I share a screen? Yeah, I think so. Let me see how this works. <clears throat> um, okay. Now, do I, I think you, I'm open for sharing. So I think you could, whoops, yeah, I, think I think you can I do, it do it on it. your end. Yeah, so let's see if that works. Okay, good. Can you see the uh, image there on my screen? Yes, I can see it. Still? Yes. All right, revitalizing Hudson Riverfronts, Stony Point. So this is um, Smart Growth Guide for the Riverfront Development. It was done in 2010. Uh, these are strategies, tools, and techniques that are um, on the basis of New York State's a coastal management program saying so any town that does an LWRP should follow these same uh, the same type of guidance. It won an award from the Westchester Municipal Planning Federation, uh, New York Planning Federation, and the uh, US EPA um, Region 2. The book is divided into um, six chapters. And then climate change is a theme that runs through the whole uh, book. 
Um, these are the, the categories that the book addresses and I'll go through them uh, one by one. Um, and by the way, um, revitalizing HudsonRiverfronts.org, I think that website still works for the publication. I'll double check that and send it to George tomorrow. Um, the cover of the book shows this image. It's a stylized rendering of what um, an ideal Hudson Riverfront community would look like. You see compact development, a grid of streets, protected green space and wetlands around it, uh, active waterfront and uh, strong connections through the community to the water and then on the water as well. And you'll see some of these illustrate, illustrated now as we um, go through it. The first First idea is to promote riverfront development in areas with existing infrastructure. And this is the, the theme behind smart growth. And that's uh, to develop in places that has existing water and sewer, uh, hopefully adjacent to it downtown. Stony Point's a little bit different, right? You've got this kind of waterfront that has a bunch of marinas and, and uh, I'm not even sure that you guys really have a downtown. You've got sort of a, a strip along Route 9W. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to building um, adjacent to your existing uh, built area or existing downtown, whether that's on the waterfront or um, in your upland business district. Uh, you've got existing transportation, water and sewer infrastructure. Uh, all the services are there. And that means people might be able to um, walk or bike to places rather than drive everywhere to, to conduct their business and do their errands. Um, a lot of communities have historic building stock, you know, places like Nyack and Poughkeepsie and Peekskill, and it's better uh, just to reuse these buildings than to be building uh, modern buildings. Uh, again, it, it encourages uh, walking, bicycling, active transportation, healthful lifestyle, it's, helps to uh, mitigate uh, against climate change, uses less carbon, less driving, better air quality. Theoretically, by building in your existing built areas, uh, that um, takes away the, the need to build out in the countryside, uh, cutting trees, uh, and building on farmland. And again, all this helps mitigate against warming planet. The second um, a chapter deals with connecting people to the river, and it's not just connecting people to the river, but connecting people along the river, across the river, and from the river into your community. So we like to say connecting people to the river and beyond. And this is really uh, my favorite uh, chapter in the book because um, I love the river and I think this is where communities have uh, the most um, uh, potential. And as I go through these uh, different strategies, tools, and techniques, I hope you'll be thinking about Stony Point and how these can apply to your community. Um, so first and foremost, uh, the idea is to create a continuous riverfront greenway uh, along the shoreline. And I think where, where Eagle Bay really misses the mark is that um, it's got this uh, sort of uh, riverfront esplanade that's all well and good. And yes, I think the public will be able to walk on it, but it doesn't really go anywhere. It doesn't extend to the north to the Stony Point battlefield the way it's designed, it doesn't connect to future riverfront development at, um, you know, that might happen at marinas uh, to the south. So it's really designed, the, 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 the quote unquote public space at Eagle Bay is really designed more like a, um, a, a private park for the people that'll live there. It'll function that way. Uh, and the, um, I, I, don't, I don't think it'll really be that useful or welcoming to townspeople. So the idea to have this continuous riverfront greenway is to have at least a hundred foot minimum setback so that um, there's a place for the water to go when flooding occurs. And then this riverfront greenway can also be a place to provide uh, waterfront walkway, trails, et cetera. Um, at the um, foot of a, of a main street or a downtown, you don't really have this kind of situation in, um, Stony Point, but the idea is that the, the, the setback may be a little bit less. Uh, if there are smaller buildings that are built closer to the riverfront, they should be built in a way where flood waters can, can go in and out of the building without um, damaging things. 
Uh, there should be a, at least a 16 foot multi-use path uh, that's along the river and the grade should be raised up above the 500 year floodplain. As you get farther from that downtown area, the, 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 it should become more, uh, more green space, less park-like areas, like, like less um, um, plazas, paved plazas, but this 100, 100 rule should still apply and that's maintaining 100 foot minimum setback uh, or avoiding the 100 year floodplain, whichever is greater. One thing you see in this uh, rendering is a street that is, let's see if my cursor can find it. The building is here uh, and there's a street between the building and the riverfront. And that's really important because it, it lets the people know that are in the park that they are in a public space, whoops, and they're not, um, and they're not um, sort of um, occupying a place that's the backyard of a building. And the way Eagle Bay is designed, the build, the park is just between the building and the and the and the riverfront. And I think people are going to feel some people are going to feel like they're uh, sort of in the backyards of of the condos. Um, then finally, further away, still uh, adhering to the hundred by hundred foot rule, you have more habitat protection and. Um, and, and a more of a vegetated shoreline as you get farther from that um, built riverfront. Um, but what do you connect to? Um, I alluded to this earlier. It's not just a path along the riverfront. You see a nice uh, path here, which is down in Tarrytown, um, but it's connecting from the riverfront to your business districts, your downtowns, to neighborhoods where people live, historic sites, um, museums, other parks, schools and educational communities, and either even other communities across the river where there might be a water taxi or perhaps some ferry service or access across the bridge, which some communities uh, have. And there are many different ways uh, to connect. They can be done, you know, the, the walkway comes to mind, but there can be trolleys uh, that run back and forth like the one you see here in Kingston, uh, docks, to connect people to the river so they can do things like go fishing, um, you know, even beaches, beaches, swimming areas they have in, in Beacon, they have a river pool, which is sort of a rope, an area roped off with floats uh, that people can actually swim um, in the river without having a, a sandy beach, uh, visually connecting to the river with view corridors, and then making cultural connections by having interpretive materials, festivals, farmers markets and things for people to do at the river. Um, and I think that these are things that can certainly happen in Stony Point. Um, the way that the connections are made are with uh, voluntary trail easements. Uh, there can be incentive zoning. So if, uh, you know, this is something you can think about when you update your comprehensive plan and the um, marina to the south may get uh, developed, there can be provisions in the zoning where more units can be built if um, something is provided back to the town. So for example, a bigger park um, or other types of amenities that the community comes together and decides that it needs uh, for that riverfront. Connections along, along roads, sidewalks, there can be banners that draw people or artwork um, along the river. Um, Hudson River water trail sites um, that are promoted as a network by the Hudson River Greenway oh. and that could um, provide a connection for people arriving by kayak or canoe. Um, this New York State, because waterfront land is in short supply, encourages water dependent uses and water enhanced uses. Water dependent uses simply means, as you might imagine, uh, whatever goes on there um, has to, it, it requires a waterfront use. So a marina, fishing pier, fish, fr fish processing plant uh, would all be examples of water dependent uses. Water enhanced uses are uses that um, don't need to be on the river, but um, their riverfront location um, can make them more viable. So perhaps a hotel, um, might have been a good good type of use for for the Eagle Bay site, um, restaurants um, and even residences. If um, 
if, if enough public space is provided um, as part of the development. Um, so, you know, an example of water dependent use would be uh, a dock where tour boats can land to bring people to uh, a community. Um, protecting natural resources. Uh, this means uh, the shoreline, uh, not building hardened shoreline, having shorelines that uh, embrace nature um, and provide for habitat and also um, how water is managed in the community. Um, is the water um, managed well, um, infiltrated back into the ground with things like permeable parking like you see in the upper left-hand corner, green roofs or green streets like you see on the right-hand side um, where water is um, uh, not just simply running um, on from pavement into the stream but can be infiltrated back into the Uh, shorelines, um, you know, I think the old fashioned way is to put up a hardened shoreline like you see in the upper left. Scenic Hudson bought that property and then tore the house down and then um, redeveloped it like you see on the right with a sloped shoreline into the river, uh, protected by stone gabions. And uh, the, the house was replaced by a, a pavilion that water can flow through if we get some high tides. And you see some better alternatives in the lower part of this um, slide that shows uh, wooden gabions or stone riprap that have planting plugs in it to provide some habitat value. The New York State DEC has a great program called Sustainable Shorelines, and this uh, discourages people from having um, just plain stone riprap or, um, or a vertical bulkhead and sustainable shorelines provide a lot of different benefits like you see uh, here. Protecting scenic resources is an important part of revitalizing Hudson River fronts. Um, there are ways, uh, strategies, tools, and techniques in the book that explain how to, um, how to build things that are compatible with the landscape, not breaking the ridge line, orienting buildings, um, perpendicular to the shoreline instead of vertically or instead of horizontally or parallel to the shoreline, uh, building at the toe of the slope instead of up on top of the slope. Um, promoting good urban planning and sustainable design is a theme that kind of relates back to the first smart growth um, chapter of the book. And this is creating walkable communities. Um, buildings close to the street, sidewalks. It's kind of everything that Eagle Bay is not, right? Eagle Bay is a, a typical suburban apartment complex oriented around um, uh, parking lots. Um, and I think that that was a real missed opportunity there, but perhaps um, this can be done better if the site to the south is ever redeveloped. So building around a grid of streets with buildings close to the road um, and parking in the middle of the blocks uh, instead of just sort of around all the buildings. Um, this good urban design um, really relates back to um, the scale of the community and revitalizing Hudson Riverfronts is not a one size fits all approach. Um, there are big differences between Yonkers, Poughkeepsie, Beacon and Cold Spring in size. So we don't say, you know, what size building is too tall it's really should be done through a community planning process and um, relate to uh, existing conditions and what the vision for the community is. Um, but here are some examples of things like transit oriented development in the um, upper left hand side of the slide around the Poughkeepsie train station. There's adaptive reuse of those historic buildings. Um, once a brewery um, is now a bar, restaurant, uh, offices and spa. Uh, in the upper right is some infill development. So this was a, um, an urban re uh, development site in Newburgh. Uh, the buildings were, were, were tore down many, many years ago. Um, probably should have saved the buildings and redeveloped them, but they were tore down. And for about 30 years, that site was vacant. Now uh, 11 homes were built that reflect the historic character of the buildings across the street. And at least they're pretty close to the street respecting the street line. And um, in the lower left are buildings close to the street 
um, in the city of Poughkeepsie and lower right is a um, old carpet factory in Poughkeepsie that was redeveloped as a um, 20 apartment building, all near the train station. So the idea is really to, to create uh, compelling spaces. Um, places where people want to go, want to get where there are things to do. And, um, you know, and I think in Eagle Bay, it's basically, you know, a lot of lawn, uh, grass and a walkway with some park benches. Uh, this is the city of Yonkers where a parking lot was removed. Um, and under the parking lot was the Sawmill River uh, that was buried about 100 years ago in a culvert. Um, so through a 30, $35 million project, the... Um, River was exposed back to the daylight, a park created, and um, hundreds of millions of dollars of um, development was encouraged along uh, the edges of that park. Uh, when you look at some zoning, uh, the, the town might think about some form-based code zoning. And this form-based code means it's not sort of your traditional written zoning code that has things like setbacks, and types of uses and building heights, but it's illustrated to show what the buildings should look like, uh, how they relate to the street, and um, in, all in an illustrated form. Uh, of course, we have to make sure that, that sea level rise is dealt with. The river is a 150 mile uh, estuary, an arm of the sea that come, rises and, and lowers with the tides uh, twice a day. The, um, you have experienced that, unfortunately, through um, the past decade with several storms. And th there are three responses to sea level rise. Uh, you can um, defend three different types of adaptations. You can defend against it by building a giant wall. Um, you know, the wall works great until the water overtops the wall or until somebody wants to be behind the wall and realizes they're constantly looking at a wall and they're not looking at the river anymore. Um, another way is to accommodate the water, let the water come in, um, but perhaps raise buildings like you see this lighthouse being raised or a house being raised uh, down at um, Grassy Point. Uh, this is the approach they've taken in some houses where they've raised homes along the river. Uh, the photograph there is Long Dock uh, Park in Beacon, where uh, it's basically an amphibious park where water can come in. And the building that you see in that picture is a kayak um, kayak storage building, but it, it doesn't have solid walls. So when the water comes in, uh, it, it, it harmlessly goes over a concrete slab and through the, the open walls of the building and then goes back out. Then the other is relocating. Uh, sometimes things have to be moved back from the shore. See that picture of the lighthouse. Chris, how you doing? By 20, 2100, it could be anywhere between 15 inches and, and 75 inches, right? So like basically just over a foot to um, uh, six feet plus. As, and um, it, it all depends on whether the ice caps melt and whether we uh, do anything about uh, the carbon usage that we're doing uh, today. So when communities are going to plan for their waterfronts, they have a choice to make. Um, are they going to be assuming the, the, the worse or are they going to be assuming for the better? And this chart shows the type of risk tolerance decision making that communities have to go through. So um, are the ice caps going to re remain intact or are they going to melt? Um, are they going to plan for the better or plan for the worse? So if you um, plan for the better um, and, you, and you figure things are not going to be so bad, you may not spend as much. You may not do as much, uh, and if you're lucky, the ice caps are intact, you're going to be safe. But if um, you plan for the better and uh, the worst happens, uh, you're going to be unsafe. So this sh chart shows how the decision-making process is, um, has to be conducted by communities. Um, these are some more examples of waterfront resilient design uh, at our Long Dock Beacon site that shows uh, on the upper left a, a sculpture that's done at the um, at the end of the point where uh, you're seeing low tide 
where there's a bridge that goes over kind of a, a little canal. Um, but when the tide comes in, the water goes through that little area and uh, people walk across the bridge so they can really understand that the river is actually tidal. Um, in the lower section, you can see um, the kayak storage building at Long Dock Park, how water can flow through it. Um, here's some examples. You know, we, I, I sent these to the folks at, um, at your planning board. Uh, I suggested that they might take a look at these when they're considering alternatives for Eagle Bay. Um, I, I don't think they really were interested. Uh, this is what's going to be built down at uh, Sleepy Hollow, the former GM site. Uh, you can see this grid of streets, um, you know, bl regular blocks uh, with um, built parking in, in, on the interior of the blocks and a park al along the edge of the whole riverfront that connects to other places. Um, these are some of the buildings uh, that are proposed um, to kind of reflect the old um, industry that you found um, along um, uh, the Hudson River riverfront cities. Um, also in Sleepy Hollow, this is the River House uh, project. Um, uh, enhanced uses, um, establish that continuous riverfront greenway, just don't have a park that doesn't lead anywhere. Um, keep those topologies in mind. Remember at the, um, at the foot of Main Street, the, the setbacks may not have to be quite as, quite as wide and you might have more, more paved area, but if, if you get away sort of north and south from that area, you'll want more and more green space. Um, and maintain um, the park above the, the 500 year floodplain. Well, I can guarantee that's not happening at Eagle Bay. Yeah, I, I know. And, you know, and I think they'll pay the price. There's my um, email address. I probably have about five minutes for uh, questions. Okay. If anybody has questions, I'll stop sharing my screen. Jeff, just so you know, I was so in love with your presentation and that book that I not only sent it to the town board, I sent it to the planning board. I sent it to uh, Mr. Ziegler. I was one of the lucky ones when that book was published. I have a physical copy. I yeah. did nothing but scream about it. And unfortunately, I guess I don't speak well enough or I don't speak loud enough. They literally, I sent it to each individual town board member, each individual planning board member. That is such a great thing or resource. Uh, thank you for that, Susan. And I'm glad you have the, a physical book. There are none left. Um, <laughs> but, um, I, I don't think it's a matter of you not speaking loud enough or articulately enough. They say you um, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And I think that clearly this horse wasn't wasn't thirsty or it was <laughs> uh, or, uh, Jeff, Jeff, you know, uh, the kind of Jeff. suburban development that you find up on nine. Yeah, but, OK, Mike, before you do that, I have one question for Jeff, just one. And it regards what he's got on October 13th, 2020. The. I think it was the planning board issued a petition to amend the town zoning code to allow the utilization of the advisory base flood elevations. Does, does that mean anything to us? They, they have changed the flood elevations on this project from, from I think the FEMA elevations to, I, but there's such confusion as to what is the legal FEMA res, uh, elevation to what is, I, I'm not exactly sure. So it's the FEMA flood elevation. Yeah, I I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know, uh, Susan. I, I'm not familiar with what they've done there. Yeah, that was actually my question because as you had mentioned in Grassy Point, they lifted up the homes, the new homes. Yeah. There, so I was wondering uh, at what point, at what height are the um, the condos going to be get, you know, the livable space going to be? I mean, I'm wondering that, like, is it going to be like right on the ground? You know, I, I'm a little curious about that. Yeah. George, you remember, is it like 11 feet above um, mean high water? Or It was supposed to be 14, I thought, but, um, you know, don't forget, they're going to increase the elevation yeah, uh, of the building. Just so that they put parking under the buildings. Yeah, then on top of that, they're going to build a four-story building. So 
these buildings are gonna probably be, I think we thought about 60 feet higher than the ground level is right now due to the elevation increase uh, and the construction of the building, somewhere around 55 to 60 feet, I thought was about what, from what it is today. Yeah. Um, uh, Jeffrey, if I may, and George, if I may, because this is a um, community-based program and it's the political season, meaning we're having elections. And the, the question or the, my, my point for Jeff is this. About the soundness, about the soundness of uh, environmental uh, ism, uh, sound land use planning. Everything you said, because it's a brilliant presentation, I agree. But if it doesn't go to the average and convince the average resident, the average resident won't have an influence on the average member of the planning board, and that person is going to make unsound and unwise decisions. And it's democracy at work, folks. So what we need to do is market these ideas to the citizenry so that they can talk to the town board and the planning board and, and the um, various uh, people and, and convince people. Now, the other point I want to make is uh, the planning, sorry, yeah, the, the planning board folks doesn't create projects. You have landowners who, who consultants to try to figure out what can we do to maximize our profit with the land. That's how business works. So you can't expect the planning board to say, oh, we want, uh, we want to propose a hotel and suddenly a hotel is going to come in. No, you need the landowner to figure out, and again, it, it's maybe partly selling to the public that we would like something different than residential housing on the waterfront. So my point is, when we have to respect property rights, and also at some point in time, property owners get vested rights, and that's a big problem in the, as Jeffrey knows, in the land use development process. And my bigger point is, we really need to sell to the general electorate these environmental and sound planning notions. So, you know, it would be great, frankly, if everybody in the town were, were to see Jeff's presentation because then people would be more enlightened as to what, you know, the potential is for our town and our waterfront, which I think is, I think we have great potential, but we have to have the foresight and the vision to, you know, take advantage of that potential. So I, I just like to mention, say that, you know, we did have a waterfront planning um, that did not allow Eagle Bay um, and it's just been undermined over the years. So, you know, how do you build a resilient waterfront plan that is not subject to, you know, text changes that mm -hmm. completely alter the intent of everything that's on the books. I, that's a, what I think I've seen over the last decade is good intentions, good waterfront plan um, with a small handful of people making decisions that have got us to where we are right now, which is something that's very, very contrary to where we started. You need to vote out the rascals. <laughs> it's the town board. I mean, t tell me I'm wrong. We do not have a town board that has a vision for the future. Though. We need to keep going forward. Brita, did you have a question there? Can you I'm, I'm curious as to how, you know, because we can do it again, you know, we can come up with a good waterfront plan, but, you know, I'm, I'm just, I guess, cynical at this point of like, how do you, how do you keep on course? Yeah, and that revision. Let me uh, just respond um, about the, you know, I think to address Mike's, um, First of all, um, I don't know anything about voting anybody out. We're totally nonpartisan Correct. in this. So that, that's all I need to say about that. But what you need is zoning that allows the thing that the things that the, the, the citizenry of Stony Point want for your waterfront. And you've got one parcel left. And now is the time to have a, 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 a comprehensive plan amendments new comprehensive plan or local waterfront revitalization program amendments uh, about, um, about using underwater land for density 
you know, that's why Eagle Bay got to do what they did. They, they um, for better or for worse, they, they used an interpretation of that provision of your. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, you're not, you're not partisan yeah. and George is not partisan. And George in this program invited all the political candidates of which Mary, Lauren, and I are three to be here. And the other side, our opponents, also could have been here. So you as the sponsors should not be partisan, but I am very partisan. And I say, we need new leadership with a vision for this town on the town board. And, but, Thanks for that. George, I'm gonna bow out at this point. Um, yeah. if I, um, I, I, I've been, uh, it, it has run longer than I, I thought I was gonna be, be able to be on the call, uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to present this to the community. And, um, and I'll send you a PDF of it so that you have it uh, to archive on SPACE's website. Oh, and by the way, by the way, I went to Pace Law School where we have your scenic huts and the big Thanks everyone. On wall. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I think the challenge here now is Thank to take you. the information that we have and try to figure out how to get the planning board and or the town board as they are current to at least hear the concerns. Brita, you and I have stood so shoulder to shoulder. We've had the same comments. They've been consistent. They've been repeated time and again. They're in the EIS, they're in the draft, they're in, the, they're in all of the comments. The traffic, the water, the road, Beach Road will not be improved. What do we do now with what we have in front of us? To me, I'm sorry, Susan. Can I ask why are they not going to improve that road? Because I know, like, I, I go down to Miami Beach a lot, and they have all these projects where they're lifting the roads up higher, you know, because it's such a low water table. Why are they refusing to? I don't understand that. Like, you know, I'm just trying to figure that out. I think there is a letter, George, somewhere in all this filing from the county. But in Rockland, were we different? The road, when you drive Beach Road, and Steve and Breida will correct me, the houses are built on top of the road because of the error in which they were built. In order to really move that road, in all honesty, you'd have to tear all of the homes down to get the space to improve that road. I can be very wrong. You can improve, you can put the wall back, you can try to fix the drainage, but the point is it's built in the river on top of the riverbank. And when the tide comes in, that road is going to flood. And but from what I understand, uh, and talking to Stephen Beckerley about this in the past, is a lot of drainage comes down from the inland side as well. So if the, if the road level was raised, it would indeed trap the water on the side of the residential homes as well. So it's not, it's not an easy solution. And I didn't go to all those meetings on the discussion they had with the neighbors about the proposal after Hurricane Floyd I'm um, sorry, uh, was it hurricane, was it the hurricane, right? Was it, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, to discuss what the options were, but <clears throat> I think that's, it was complicated because they could raise the road, but indeed the road would then trap the water was, in on that side as well. There was New York rising money and it was basically the proposal as I understood it was to take a fairly extensive section of the roads, road and raise it up to 3.2 feet. But as you say, that would have created an elevated road and a ditch behind it with the houses in the ditch, um, yeah. because it really is the space for access or any kind of a meaningful downgrade to get a driveway into those houses. Um, so it, it was it was basically unfeasible. Yeah. As promoted. And when we did the zoning, Breed is right. When we did the original zoning on the master plan, because I was on the original master plan committee, we we zoned that property as protected waterfront and didn't allow the kind of other building other than boat related building. And then we decided that at some point we'd wanna make a zoning that would accommodate commercial and restaurants and things. And that's what happened when Jeff Finn was in pretty much as a favor though to Wayne Quartz who wanted to build originally down there. But we're getting a lot more residential than we got with Wayne Quartz's proposal uh, than we did commercial. So it seems to me that we're allowing a lot more residential construction on the waterfront than we had anticipated when the decision was made to adjust the zoning to allow more a balance between commercial and residential. So we're getting more of the residential, which 
you know, not only adds to the traffic, but uh, it causes a lot of other issues there as well. So I don't think we're getting what we thought we were getting. And then with the application of this law that had not been applied to the waterfront, we're getting even more. Uh, and I guess they're donating money now to a study for the sewer system or something. And it all has to do with the sewer, in my view, um, and sewer capacity and getting mm -hmm. cash for that as opposed to doing good planning. Didn't the town get some money for that project back when they got some relief funds from somewhere? No. For the, that well, was the, New York, the New York Rising money. I think it was about $3 million that was, and I think about, you know, at least over a million of that went into consultancy and studies. Right. Um, but some, whatever the residual was, I believe was dedicated towards sewer. Okay. It, I didn't think they I didn't think they got the money at the end of the day. I think I thought they didn't they never got that last piece. Is that of right? Oh, I that's right. My husband says that's right. They never got it. Yeah, right. because, because they didn't fill the paperwork. They, they out did the not time. submit the correct uh, on time. So there's no failure of, of people, politicians, both Democrats and Republicans, not taking this seriously. And once again, we don't have planning. I don't think you should be discouraged. I, I, I sense that we're discouraged because we've been fighting this for so long, but you know, this is a, a dramatic moment in history where um, uh, because of the party in power, they're actually taking water and climate seriously. And this might be the one opportunity we have to seek money if the infrastructure bills do pass. Uh, I think we're positioned well, politically to do that. And it, it just is imperative that we take this opportunity to try to really replan the waterfront in Stony Point. This is, this is not gonna work. You yeah. can't build on the river. The river I have is more a, powerful. I have a question. This is all great to re, replan and master plan. And like we're doing that in Clarkstown. They, they have not listened to all of the input from the citizens. They just keep on doing what they want to do. Well, that's so the, the thing is, how do you how do you reach, you know, this this presentation tonight, the drawings were charming. It all seems to make sense, you know, wonderful to re-envision and redevelop. But you have a town planning board and zoning board, maybe people are getting paid off. I don't really know that are allowing this to go forward. And probably if it doesn't go forward, the town is going to be sued by this developer. Yes. So how does one fight this kind of um, nepotistic uh, society that exists with development? Yeah, well, we had a building inspector for 30 some odd years, uh, Jackie, who was very accommodating to all the builders and he retired in October prior to this project coming right. to final. So um, right. my concerns, my concerns have always been with him being at the helm, uh, kind of shepherded these projects through. I don't know what we're going to see now. We don't have that building inspector in place, and I don't know what the vision is going to be now. But uh, that's what we were getting. So I mean, you keep you can't keep on pushing the same beautiful alternatives. Like we we keep on trying to let people know about Hickory Hill in Japan instead of building three-story monstrosities for senior housing. But, you know, the, these um, town planners or the town board or planning board, they have their own idea of obviously what they want. And it seems like we're, like the community at large is between a rock and a hard place now with how to make this better for the public. Like it's gonna go through. So then the question is, how do you make it better for the public? How do you preserve safety for the public? Um, how do you pre preserve enjoyment of the natural resources and historical resources for the public? Because this this thing doesn't do that. You have to like change this board's thinking. I'm concerned about us getting more of the same because the zoning would allow this to board. be built just so south the, of the where we are now. The going to think the same way no matter what you do. And I, you know, this was advertised also as a political event. And, you know, you have to, it lets us face the facts, you know, we, we, we are seeking political change and, and mainly, I, I, Jackie, I've refused to give up that towns cannot plan constructively and cooperatively with its citizens. 
the village of Havistor has done remarkable. So, you know, there are groups out there who can lead citizens and um, fight the fight. Uh, and we're all- bring your group to this. this bring, bring your group to this for Stony Point. <laughs> Well, it, 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 that's in part what the government has to pay for. Um, mm. And we, we don't seem to think that we need any intelligence on the board. Hey, guys, Dave Kiley here. Hey, Greg, we've uh, discussed issues in the past, and uh, I certainly supported some of your opinions on, you know, that biodiesel plant that just seemed like it was going to be a shit show uh, for multiple reasons. But for They'll succeed. Are there any projects? So, are there any projects that the space committee has gotten behind, and like any viable alternatives to what is being considered by the board? You know what? This is Susan Filgaris, and I am a board member of Space. Thank you for bringing that up. One of the things that we advocate is making the public aware of what the project is. I've had my private opinions on certain things, but Eagle Bay, we started day one with Wayne Quartz. We sat down, we reviewed his projects, we brought him out. I put the uh, River Keeper in everybody's hands. I brought the development across the river in. I sent websites. I said, if we're going to do this, can we look at these sites that will give us an idea of how to operate and, and how it's been successful in other areas? I didn't say don't build. I think if we could build something that Jeff Anzavino showed us, it would be spectacular. And I could support that. What I can't support is, and they have said this, and I will go back through all the minutes and find it for you. They are not interested in the waterfront at all. The attorney said that. We are not interested in waterfront development. We are a residential housing developer, and that's all we're interested in developing. Okay. I don't believe residential housing belongs there. I believe. I understand, and I get that. And certainly, there are differing opinions on that. And I'm not saying I'm for Eagle Bay because there's definitely some issues, especially with the the exits, entrance, the flooding, and all of that. But I'm just. It just seems like it's a very. And maybe it's just a, a nature of our political times right now. But you know, the the only time there's ever any discussion between space and the board is when Greg's yelling at Jim or Jim's yelling back, and it just seems. No one's actually willing to cooperate. And I'm just asking, are there any actual proposals that you guys have ever like really tried to find or work with the town to try to get some rateables in here? Because I just, you know what? and I apologize if you guys feel I'm overstepping. I thought this was going to be kind of a yes, um, community discussion, but it yeah, just seems yeah. like... Yeah. Dave, we were. No, I think it, you know. I will tell you this. I sat on the community reconstruction zone program. I took days off of work. I took half days. I did weekend work. I contributed what I thought I could to the input of that program. I have volunteered to sit on various committees to bring the research and say, "Here it is." I've I've spent my money and time and said here here is what's happened before. Can we develop responsibly? I I don't. Well, I get all that, Susan, and and I, I'm certainly not questioning the time you've spent and the dedication because obviously you guys are dedicated. You guys are on in all these meetings, and I applaud that because I really don't have time to do it. But I do get involved when I, I see these big things coming down the pipe, and it just always seems like this battle between the town board and space on trying to get some reasonable rateables in here. And the biodiesel thing, I totally got. Um, I'm not on the space committee, but I've, I've, I've been around George since in my twenties at the podium at the, uh, since I was 21 at the podium at that town. And I, I myself as, a, as an owner of property on 9W presented multiple times because I was on the corridor 
for a town center. Um, there were trees there. I don't even know if George remembers this. This is probably yeah. 35 or 40 years ago. But, um, yeah. you know, I've always felt, having grown up here, space has been around a very long time with, with me. But it just seems that every time there is anything viable, years so it didn't go anywhere because I fought for three years I spent all my money and it's 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 frustrating to me to sit here 40 years later and listen to the same conversations that I've been listening to since I tried to do that so now they're proposing something on the opposite end of that spectrum where where are we going what is the vision what is the plan of of the of the of the fabric of this community is I think where, where I'm headed because especially if there are problems with floods and things that are very legitimate that George is bringing up and that everyone is bringing up about how this project is going to go through without emergency exit and entrance with flood zones. <laughs> how is that going to happen? If you can't even put a town center that doesn't have any of that, but you're, and now they're going to dig up 9W. I mean, we, we have so many issues that need attention. And unless like, we aren't there some have positives? Aren't there some well, positives in bringing in? I, I think let's, let's say good. we let's say we scaled it back. Let's say we right. scaled back yes. this Eagle right. Bay development and make right. it a more reasonable size. There are positives. Yes, and it just I seems to that. me like this this entire meeting was hundred percent focused on the negatives. So, uh, and, the gentleman is, the gentleman that gave the proposal as far as how to properly develop riverfront living, I agree. Mm -hmm. That looks great. I would love for this town to be something like a cold <laughs> spring, but the problem so, is. Dave, you this this is Brita again. You know, I, I think for those of us who live close by the marina that uh, Eagle Bay is going to Brita, Brita, hold on. Can people like mute themselves. Yeah, people who aren't speaking Please. should mute. Thank you. So, you know, for those of us who've lived near this marina for many, many years, you know, Wayne Quartz was very clear in what his intention was that it would be developed. We all knew it. We were not sitting here, you know, angry that there was going to be a development. That was his intent. He, he was very forthright. He spoke to us as neighbors for years. Um, and I'm, I'm going way back before even 2010 uh, about his hope and his intent of and is, you know, th that that frankly wasn't a very viable marina long term. It silts up. It had economic issues of its own. So that was a known quantity. Um, a huge uh, people here, including George, were very involved in a waterfront development plan that was put in place back in, I think it was 2010. Um, and it was built around the expectation that there would be development and it would promote development of the riverfront in a way that would sort of make the riverfront somewhat central to the identity of Stony Point going forward and hopefully would be something that would be beneficial to the town to build around in terms of an identity. Um, and what Which I happens, think everyone loves, but we right. need investors to I think to your come question in. though is, are we all being negative? And I think the answer is really not. First of all, we're not all the same here. We're not all one group. Um, we, we all have different things we're bringing to the table, but I think what, what we're seeing now um, is what the expectations and the plans were having been undermined pretty steadily through this entire development process. And that's a, a matter of record, which is what we saw initially as proposals. I mean, I think I remember New England townhouses with, you know, uh, mm -hmm. widow's walks on them. You know, it's, it's just kept morphing and morphing. And every time it morphs, it's worse. It's bigger. It takes more away from recreational. It takes more away from mixed use. And quite frankly, what I think that we have at this point is a gated community that has taken a chunk of the riverfront that will simply be gone. It's not going to be contributive in any way of adding to the town or the community's uh, you know, use of the riverfront to further benefit future projects. It's going to be a negative and it's, it's a removal of a whole chunk of the riverfront. So I don't think this is a, an against this project at all. I think it's against this project now has become and what it represents. I also wanna just say, I heard that number six million in, in revenue to the town uh, for the first time tonight, I've never seen that before, but that would be 23,000 per unit in taxes a year. But where is that number? That's an incredible number. Yeah. Um, 
you know, and, and then the other part is, you know, it, it's sort of, you know, you can look at this and say, you know, negative, negative. I live on Beach Road. I've lived mm-hmm. here for the last three days when you, you could not get in and out of homes for four hours a day. <clears throat> you know, this is the main entrance. I mean, this entire project is disingenuous in its current format in saying it can be done. You know, the road, uh, it's to my detriment uh, in, in all probability, any resolution here. But it's ridiculous to sit here and look at that road and say that you're gonna have 264 units of, uh, of inhabited apartments dependent on that road. Mm-hmm. Now, a, isn't there so some, high. and I know they haven't suggested it so far, but yeah. isn't there a possibility that this developer could improve Beach Road, could improve? No, there's nothing planned, Dave. It, and you know, it, 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 I mean, it's been every which way you can imagine it's been it's been proposed it's been argued against in fact i mean i will tell you that in the plans and i believe it it sort of states that they reviewed the road and it never flooded basically at inconvenient times i i think was sort of how they presented it in the survey this this road floods you know twice probably eight months of the year yeah i know yeah yeah yeah, so so, you know um... i i i I, I guess i would sort of just feel like uh you know, I don't think we're all bringing negativity to everything that's proposed by a but, long, long shot. Okay. I think there's a lot of reasons on this particular. There's I'm just letting you guys know favorite. how it appears. You know, I don't particularly have a dog in this fight when it comes to Eagle Bay. I could tell you that. And, um, you know, I know a couple of you because I, I live in the area. I'm up in the colony now. So I know a couple of you personally. Um, and I like you guys. You all seem very nice. And it seems like your heart is in it for the right reason. I'm just telling you that, you know, this was proposed as like a community discussion. And it was not. It, it, it was, you know, all people who I, were invited didn't come. Yeah, they you're being given the I chance invited. to talk, Dave. It's I, a community I know. Discussion. Well, I know that, but I think, I mean, you guys know what it is. You know how the politics are here, and especially nowadays. It's super polarizing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think you're doing a good job of bringing in other people from the other side or even other people. Wait, on wait the, a second now, the Dave. They, they were invited. The supervisor, uh, Monaghan. And the yeah, three, I and know. Excuse me. Don't interrupt. I, I like to speak. Uh, they were invited. They were invited to come and they didn't participate. That's their decision. Okay. This was an opportunity for all the candidates and the public to listen and to speak. And they chose not to come. And by the way, um, I was on the master plan committee. I'm going back over 30 years I've been doing this, okay? I was on the master plan committee. I was on the waterfront development committee. We had ideas for planning for this town, but what happens is a lot of times the laws get undermined and they don't get enforced. And we had a building inspector, I think that was too cozy with a lot of the developers. So to speak out against something or to bring up information that is not being presented by the developers, certainly, so the public understands the full picture. A lot of things we have to get through freedom of information law because the town doesn't provide it. So, you know, you can't keep blinders on either. You have to look at the whole picture. That's how we got into a problem with the golf course. Dave, I was on the committee. We were in favor of the golf course. Space went out and lobbied to build a golf course. The problem is the town cut everything short on environmental impacts, and they caused a lot of drainage problems for all the people that lived in the cliffs and on on Pinjip Road, and they ended up having all kinds of flooding problems because they didn't do the environmental review properly. So we were in favor of those developments and doing and purchasing the. We had a petition for purchasing the Letchworth property. We were in favor of that, but the but the the the, the way it went through the system, it didn't do the proper process, and we ended up with a lot more problems. We based the golf course, and we're going to talk about that next week on fifty thousand mm-hmm. rounds of golf a year a season. And if you play golf, you know, you can't do 50,000 runs of golf a year. Uh, and you can't even, I don't think you can even do it in Florida. So our finances were all based on that number that was false. And yet the town board sat there and accepted it all and didn't ask the right questions. So sometimes you have to look at the questions to ask, not just what the developer or the proposal is saying. Same thing with Letchworth. And we'll get into that next week. Um, right. You have to get a realistic view of what's really going on and what we want as a community. Mm-hmm. Dave, may I ask, and this is a personal thing, and I'm glad everybody hears it. Could I don't want to take up time on the the this Zoom. Could would you sit down with me and whomever else? I think your point is well stated that I get tired of being picked on and I cry a lot. So who wants to deal with that? But my heart's in the right place. There is a public perception. 
Would you sit down and have a conversation? How do we deal with it? I advocate, I don't say I support, I don't support. What I say to people is, here's the information I found. Here's the links. You go read it. Mm -hmm. And it still comes back as bad. So how do I get, would you be open to that conversation? Make it an open I would like to know how you get past the public perception because frankly, you have a great deal of apathy in the town. And if it's not raining in my backyard or flooding in my backyard, I don't care what they do. So how do we make it positive? How do you get both sides to the table? I, I, that's a great question. I I'm open, certainly David. am not the gentleman to answer that. Um, I'm just Are expressing- Are you the maybe to help me to start the conversation? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you whenever you're free. I just don't know that I have those answers to that question. I'm just, you know, I was just a, a little disheartened. I thought this was going to be more of a, a back and forth community discussion. And you're right. If people from the other side didn't show up, then you were able to present. It's hard to have the back and, and forth. It's hard to have the back and forth. And yeah. I really believe that in an election, that's what you want. You want to listen to both sides. You want to hear 100%. what people have to say. But yes. And the problem is, I truly believe there's disinformation from both sides. And I'm not pointing any figures at anyone in particular from either side, but there are just contradictions. Where well, what is the disinformation? Like I don't the, understand. The two parties are looking at the same data points. I'm not talking about this meeting in particular. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we're getting a bit off topic, but you know, the golf course coming up and that whole conversation, I would love for both parties to get together and actually discuss it. Um, well, that would be wonderful. Yeah. So would I mean, we. Are you so guys, would I. So, so would I. And listen, I think this is great that you guys are trying to do your thing on this end. I appreciate it, which is why I joined. But I'm also planning on joining like the Patriot Hills kind of thing that Raj is doing. Good. Are you guys going to join that as well? With me? Yeah, I'd like to attend. We already it. did last year. And again, no. I mean, he had a big meeting last year about it, too. I mean, listen, this is up for vote. I think it's really important that both sides get together and hash this out and get all the facts out there so that people know. And the problem is a lot of people are just not civically engaged, yeah. um, including myself. Listen, I got two kids, a house, and you know a lot of other things to deal with. It's not easy, especially for younger people, uh -huh. to get engaged at your level. All so right. I do appreciate you guys being civically involved, but... Um, it's just not, it's not. Uh, well, information is key. And I think we try to provide it. And, you know, so people can make their own decisions too. They don't have to listen to me, you know, just be aware yeah, that there's a lot more. Are online. I mean, if there's, if there's information that needs to be had, I mean, I think there are people on here that put out the contract website. I mean, we're not, I'm not telling anyone to believe anything. They don't want to, they vote what they want to vote for whatever, yeah. but there's contracts and there's facts online that are signed that are, you know, readily available to most people but most people don't read or don't show up to these types of meetings we have them on both sides raj has his for that you know this we have plenty of meetings on both sides and you get the same people at the meetings every single time yeah. so uh, but i just want to i just want to state that i think raj please look for it mari help me there's an october 23rd yes october 23rd at, at patriot hills uh right the, um, yes, yes. We can make sure we get that out there. It's and all it's all over online. Yes, yes. Yeah. And we're going to have a talk you. next Wednesday. Wednesday. I want to thank Dave for the conversation. I want to thank Dave for saying I would like to have, and and I think I kind of share your disappointment because where is the other side? So Dave. I thank you, and I'm open to conversation. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to apologize for it. But what I yeah, want, I'm not saying you guys are right or wrong. I'm not passing judgment. I just wish, uh, especially in these times, both sides would kind of talk and try to figure stuff out a little bit more. It just seems. Uh, I mean, you're both. Can I get on your team? Very counterproductive. <laughs> okay, guys. I, would, I think we should I wrap like, this up. I would like to say something. Yeah. Um, this is Jackie Drexler, and I live in Valley Cottage. And, you know, I got involved in this whole thing. Uh, I guess 10 years ago when this started, primarily because I love the Hudson River and, um, and, and land and knowing that climate change was happening and flooding was happening and, you know, have a straw bay and the desalination plant that got destroyed mm -hmm. by Hurricane Sandy and all of the damage that, that, that happens. It's, it's so inconceivable to me 
to be building something this big right on the river. So, you know, right there, I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's no setback, there's nowhere for the water to go. Um, and then there's all of the wetlands. Um, so for me, you know, I got involved in this really on an environmental level, um, but I've seen all of the changes over time. And first there was gonna be maybe low income or housing and then it wasn't. And, you know, the drawings only showed white people walking on the, on the, the, the path there at the waterfront. And it, it just kept on changing. And you know, this is about who's right and who's wrong. This is just about what's right for the area and for, for this beautiful area of Hudson River, of historical, you know, sites of, of, of a community that, that, you know, has been hard hit by Sandy. There could be just more community spaces it, within this project. And so it's very inclusive and exclusive at the same time. Mm -hmm. And really, I'm just, I've just been involved with this for many years, really as a water protector and as a Hudson River lover. And I look at other communities and what's been done and I just don't understand how Stony Point is, has let something like this happen when there could have been such other beautiful development. And so well, I, think a lot of I those just wanted decisions, to explain while I'm here because I'm not from your community, but I've sure. been involved, you know, I just, so I just wanted you to know that there are other people here who aren't even a member of the Stony Point community, but are still concerned and involved in, in it, even though I don't actually live there. I just, I I just wanted that. to meet I think, you. I think that's awesome. That, that's, that's very well attached. And listen, I appreciate all you guys. I think you're doing a great thing. I'm just trying to, I'm more of a, on a fact-finding mission to see what the truth is. And, you know, right. well, there's, important. there's some truths and really the truth also about that, that elevated place with the, the CX trains, you know, this is a very serious thing because also with Chippy coming and the fact that that line is used for bomb trains, it's going right behind this development. There's no access for emergency vehicles. I mean, there's other concerns that aren't even being discussed here today, which I probably shouldn't even have brought up, but you know, now that Chippy's been approved by Governor Hochul and NYSERDA, <clears throat> it's very possible that there's going to be some real trouble there when you have the backdrop is the CSX line. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, especially knowing that that road floods and there's no access, no ingress, you know, it's just very scary to think of. Sure. Well, I just want to thank everybody for being on the call and, and I appreciate your input. I do. And I, I'd like to this is something we wanted to try to do to have a conversation and we're going to try and do two more of these meetings and hopefully more people will participate and i'd like to see all the candidates involved and uh, we'll we'll try our best uh that's what i think is important you know that we have we talk about things and have a conversation and have a vision for the town so i just want to say thank you to all of you for being part of it tonight and be well have a good week okay well thank you all everybody. yeah okay thank you <laughs> With and that, we'll and nice goodbye. meeting you, Mr. Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> bye, bye, gang. Okay. Bye, bye. Bye. bye, -bye.